Annenberg Media. What can psychology tell us about where the processes of the mind are located within the structure of the human brain? From visual perception and imagination to how we evaluate social groups. Cognitive neuroscience, this time on Discovering Psychology. one man's misfortune began psychology's long journey into the mystery of the human brain. Phineas Gage, a railroad worker, suffered a catastrophic injury while preparing to blast bedrock. The iron rod he was using to pack the gunpowder blasted through his skull and tore away the front part of his brain. Remarkably, Gage never lost consciousness and was even able to joke with the doctor when he arrived. After a few months, he seemed to recover his health fully, but he was no longer Gage. Hostile, impulsive, unable to control his emotions or his obscene language, Gage lived 13 more years with this new, disturbed personality. With this celebrated case, psychologists began to connect brain injury with changes in behavior. They could begin to map where the processes of the mind were located within the human brain. But the study of the brain through injury is a slow process. So psychologists have developed a number of tools to measure the brain functions of normal people. Electroencephalogram recordings, or EEG, record brain waves with scalp electrodes. Event-related potentials, or ERP, can record brain waves during specific cognitive events. Computer-assisted tomography, or CAT scan, can show the brain's structure. Positron emission tomography, or PET scan, was first to image the brain in action. But a new tool introduced in the 1990s goes one step further. Functional magnetic resonance imaging, or fMRI, can show the brain at work in high resolution. For the first time, psychologists can see the minds functioning deep inside the physiology of the active brain in normal people. When our brain is active, it uses up the oxygen supply in that area. This momentary depletion is followed by an oversupply of oxygen rushed to the site. This alters the magnetic qualities of the blood, a change recorded by the scanner. After further computer processing, a detailed picture of that local brain activity emerges. With new brain imaging technology, psychological scientists can explore far more about our abilities than ever before. From better known systems like perception to less understood systems like motivation and emotion. Perhaps our most awe-inspiring ability is how we see the world. Vision is so complex, about 40% of our brain is devoted to it. Decades of human and animal studies have revealed what is happening in the early stages of vision. Light energy converted to neural signals travels from the retina to the thalamus. Then these signals move to the back of each hemisphere of the brain, to an area called the primary visual cortex. It is this area that researchers are beginning to explore with fMRI. David Heger has studied some of the specialized functions of this visual center. 
of the neocortex, pretty much the back third, uh, is involved in some way or another uh, with visual processing. The primary visual cortex, which is also called V1, is the first receiving area in visual cortex that receives that information coming from the eyes through the thalamus. And that's right along here and rolls over a little bit onto the back side right there. And from there, uh, the neural signals fan out to a whole bunch of other uh, visual areas of the brain. In fact, there may be as many as 40 distinct visual areas in the cortex of the brain. And some of these visual areas record what we see almost photographically, a process called retinotopic mapping. Animal studies show how this works. In a monkey brain, visual neurons were chemically treated to turn dark. After seeing this wheel-like pattern, the monkey's brain recorded the image seen here in a section of its visual cortex. This representation of the physical world is the starting point for further visual processing. So, you know, as I'm looking out here uh, in front of me at some object, I need to know a lot of things about that object. I need to know how far away it is. If it's hurtling toward me, is it small enough that I can reach out and catch it, or do I have to duck and get out of the way? I might want to know something about what color it is, whether it has a texture on it or not. With fMRI, HEGA can observe visual processes at work at the back of the brain. Here we're going to look at an example of how different areas of visual cortex are specialized for different kinds of visual functions. On the top, you're seeing a flickering checkerboard here that's alternating with a blank gray screen and a pattern of randomly positioned white dots that are first moving, then stationary. The bottom two panels are showing visual cortex responding. On the bottom right, in response to the flickering checkerboard, you see activity in V1, primary visual cortex. On the bottom left, you're seeing activity in the same place, but you're also seeing activity here in the right hemisphere and over here in the left hemisphere, visual area MT, that's very specialized for visual motion processing. The visual areas funnel information to two higher processing regions. The parietal cortex helps us determine where things are in space, so we can grab, duck, and navigate and the temporal lobe helps us to determine what kinds of objects we are looking at. Nancy Kanwisha of MIT is studying a portion of the temporal lobe where we recognize a high priority object, oh, yeah, the human face. What we usually see is a little patch of brain in the back in the right hemisphere. Mine is right about in there someplace on the bottom surface of the brain that produces a much stronger signal when the subjects look at faces than when they look at anything else. All you need to do is lie there, hold still, real still, and look at ten of This brain activity occurs across a wide range of faces. Front views, side views, line drawings, cartoon faces, even cat faces all produced a very strong response. But was it really whole faces that were creating this effect, or just parts of faces? One of the things we've been concerned with is to argue that it really is faces per se that this area responds to, rather than, say, um, two little dots or curvy lines or other kind of simpler descriptions of features that may be present in faces but may not themselves be faces. So if you look at this image, most people can't tell what that is. On the other hand, if you look at this image, sometimes it takes a second, but most people eventually get it. This is actually the same image. So it's not just the curves or dots or angles in the image, because they're the same. It's the same image. It's whether you perceive a face in the image or not. For humans and other social primates, decoding faces is essential. A brief glance can tell you who someone is, their sex, their mood, and enables us to judge if they are friend or foe. Repeated processing of faces over time may actually feed back to change the structure of our brain. 
it is known that the cortex is very plastic and organizes itself around the experiences it has. So maybe simply because we look at faces all the time in our daily lives, that is sufficient to produce a special purpose patch of cortex that does face recognition. But of course the other perfectly plausible story is that recognizing faces was so critical to the survival of our primate ancestors that natural selection helped shape cortical machinery dedicated to face recognition. There's another kind of visual processing the brain engages in that is called the mind's eye, the mental imagery that occurs while we think about scenes and objects. Researchers have now discovered that many of the brain areas used for vision are also the same as those used while we imagine. Stephen Koslin of Harvard University has been investigating the relationship between these two complementary visual systems. It wouldn't it be a pity to let 40% of your brain just be involved in perception? Why not usurp that, use it in thinking as well? And that's what mental imagery is all about. Mental imagery allows us to manipulate what we have stored in visual memory. So we can use that information to anticipate and solve problems. And this sort of looks like an oxygen mask, but it's actually... With another brain imaging technology, PET scan, Koslin's team has studied how visual perception and mental imagery overlap. On a computer screen, subjects imagine the letter inside a grid. An X was displayed. The subjects had to indicate if the X touched the imagined letter. Finally, they identified objects displayed at oblique angles. Of all the brain areas active in mental imagery and in vision, two-thirds were activated in common. We quite literally see with our mind's eye. We even move our eyes in the same way while we imagine a scene as when we visually scan the scene in the external world. For example, think of your living room. As you do, you'll scan the walls looking for details. Count the windows. Even zoom in on objects in about the same amount of time as you would if you were actually viewing it. When you generate an image, you're conjuring it up. Often you actually build up an image by putting parts on it. So you've got forming images, you've got image inspection, which can involve scanning around or zooming in, interpreting patterns in images. You've got holding on to images over time, and image transformations, which include rotating, expanding, bending, various kinds of other things. Each of those abilities is carried out by a host of separate processes. We can piggyback on this enormously complicated system that helps us navigate in the world to also anticipate what we would do or to think about possibilities that don't exist currently. Using fMRI, researchers have revealed how the brain is changed by what it experiences, how it is dynamic, never static, how brain structure is changed by brain functions. It is, in a sense, a plastic brain, reshaped by what it learns, remembers, and practices. A powerful example of this responsive brain is learning how to read. Mastering the complex collection of symbols that represent language is one of childhood's greatest challenges. It is a learned skill that over time reorganizes our plastic brain. To understand how the brain adapts to reading, John Gabrielli of Stanford University presents subjects with a difficult task, reading text presented backwards. The subject will go into the scanner and perform with words presented mirror reversed. And they will perform very slowly and make many mistakes. After they come out of the scanner, we have them practice the task many times in the laboratory until they get much better at doing the task. After thousands of trials, the effort of deciphering the text becomes less conscious, more automatic. When the subject is expert, it's back to the scanner again. So we have before and after snapshots of their brain when they're not good at doing the mirror reverse text reading versus when they're very good at doing that. During the initial phase of poor performance, 
we see lots of activity in right parietal cortex, a part of the brain that's very involved in visual spatial thinking, and that we interpret as people doing mental flipping of letters. After people become very good, we see activity in that part of the brain decline, in fact disappear, and now lots of areas in the verbal left hemisphere become active. It's as if the left hemisphere, the language hemisphere, has gained skill now in dealing with this unusual presentation of letters, and your normal language systems can come into play and take full advantage of everything you know about words and letters. The shift must reflect that when we're initially doing tasks that we're poor at, we just don't have the information we need to do well at it. Through trial and error and struggle and great effort, our minds uh, acquire new information uh, that lets us approach the task differently. But it must take some time for the brain to get that information in such a way that it can use it until enough knowledge is gained through experience to allow other parts of the brain to take over and do a really terrific job. She climbed to the tippity top of the tree Gazing out on the world, she stopped, where could mom be? This kind of practice, combined with brain plasticity, is the foundation of a child's ability to read. But for some, reading is a skill that can take years to master. For children with dyslexia, the challenge is more than a vision problem. It lies in the spoken part of language. That can be exemplified by the following little game you can play with yourself, okay? How do you say the word plate without the first sound, the first phoneme, p? And the answer to that is late. Now, individuals who are dyslexic, who are completely intelligent, have had, had very successful lives, even as adults many times, cannot play these simple games. Father's Day gift one year. I got him the Phonemes are the smallest units of sound within words. For example, s, p, e, ch, all together form the word speech. Speech. But I don't even know if it's always better. These sounds, essential for decoding spoken language, are also the building blocks of reading and writing. In normal conversation, phonemes can be as short as 8 milliseconds. Phonemic awareness requires processing by a high-speed language area of the brain, usually located in the left hemisphere. But for many children with dyslexia, this area fails to activate. It's a problem that interferes with their ability to read. To solve this problem, Paula Tallell of Rutgers University has developed computer games that capitalize on how the brain changes as skills are mastered. The computer slows and amplifies the phonemes enough for a child to hear and process them. Through thousands of reward-driven trials, the games teach the skill of decoding phonemes. For kids, it's just plain fun. Each individual playing these games are getting a completely one-on-one, -on -one unique experience. Mouse click by mouse click, minute by minute, which would be very, very difficult to duplicate even with the best teacher or therapist. The computer is able to make these very small and subtle and organized changes to exactly map onto the individual's neural processing abilities at the moment and change as the individual improves. Repetitive practice with feedback moves the phoneme decoding skill where it belongs, into the high-speed language area of the brain. The result is a dramatic improvement in reading ability for these children with dyslexia after only a few weeks of training. We're very encouraged by these results, and I think they're a testament to how important it is to understand the neural basis of oral language before we move into the written language training. From vision and brain plasticity, researchers have moved into exciting new areas with fMRI-based investigations. One is a study of social influences on the brain. 
social psychologists and neuroscientists have joined forces to explore aspects of behavior once thought impossible to locate. Mazarin Banaji of Yale University has studied where prejudice lies hidden in the brain. The human mind is incredibly adept at learning very quickly who sits where, what fits with what. The question that's of interest to us is, once you've learned that association, once you've learned that fact, how are you going to use it in judging a person about whom you may not know very much at all? Our minds are full of knowledge about the status of social groups, information we have learned and stored unconsciously from the culture around us. These biased attitudes can be an automatic part of our behavior, even when we consciously claim to be tolerant. How do they affect our ability to serve as jurors or to react correctly in high-stress, high-speed situations? Are they the difference between life and death? Hi, Amanda. Today we're going to ask you... To uncover these hidden attitudes, Banaji has adapted the Implicit Attitudes Test, or IAT, to measure reaction time when we pair positive and negative values to unfamiliar black and white faces. The IAT measures the strength of association between two concepts. You can imagine how quickly can one pair words like love, joy, peace, things that mean good things with the category African-American, the category European-American. The speed with which the two can be connected is an indirect measure of one's level of prejudice towards the group. Banaji and her colleague, Anthony Greenwald of the University of Washington, have captured thousands of IAT responses from respondents on the web. These data have yielded some expected and also unexpected results. White Americans show what we might call an in-group preference. That is, they show a swiftness uh, to associate white with good and black with bad. African Americans show an interesting pattern. On average, they show no bias. About half the African Americans who take this test are showing a pro-black preference. That is, they're faster to associate black with good than white with good. But the other half are showing quite the opposite. They're showing a fast association between white and good, even though they're black. And this raises the question of the importance of culture. If a positive value for white can overpower our conscious attitudes, it should be stored and visible deep within the brain, in its emotional center, the amygdala. To see if her IAT results correlated with amygdala activity, Banaji turned to neuroscientist Liz Phelps. When you learn something in the environment, fearful or negative, the amygdala will become involved. So we would expect, if the amygdala is important in emotional learning and memory in general, that it would also be important in learning about the evaluation of social groups and the emotional properties that we assign to social groups. First, white participants were tested for an external indicator of amygdala response. When you hear a loud noise, you startle and involuntarily blink your eyes. The strength of this eye blink reflex can be measured as a baseline. If an emotionally charged image like a face is added, the intensity of your response typically increases. Most white participants blink more strongly when presented with unfamiliar black faces, an unconscious indication of fear or dislike of them. Later in the scanner, their amygdala activity was measured directly. And what was interesting is that we found a correlation. Those subjects who showed greater amygdala activation tended to show greater startle response to the black faces. These sorts of correlations indicate the extent to which culture produces its influence at every single level. The big question, of course, remains as to what it is these measures predict in the real world. Does it matter 
if a police officer has a large IAT score. Is such a police officer more likely to shoot at somebody who is black than somebody who is white? These are not experiments that have been done, but this is indeed where the field is going. It is for the next few decades to discover. In our next program, we'll move from this micro view of brain cells to a macro view that has given rise to another new branch of psychology, cultural psychology, the study of how culture shapes our thinking, feeling, and actions. For Discovering Psychology, I'm Philip Zimbardo. Annenberg Media. For information about this and other Annenberg Media programs, call 1-800-LEARNER and visit us at www.learner.org.